Hi, this is Stephen from Owner Disown. Today we're taking a look at the uh, Aorus X3 V7. Um, it is a 13.9 inch gaming notebook. Now, if you didn't know, Aorus is Gigabyte's gaming line. They are very famous for cramming in high-end hardware into a small chassis. The X3 is about uh, two centimeters thick, so that's just shy of an inch. It's about 10 inches deep, or about 26 centimeters, 13 inches long, and it weighs at about four pounds, about two kilos. It makes it very easy to carry and it's perfect for gaming on the go. Now this refreshed uh, KB Lake model has a GTX 1060 GPU and i7-7820HK CPU and that stock that is uh, clocked at 39, 37, 36, 36 multipliers on the four cores. Now it does have one stick of gig, uh, 16 gigabyte DDR4 2400 MHz RAM by Ripjaw. There's one extra slot there so you can expand it to 32 gigs. Storage, it has a 512 gigabyte SSD made by Samsung. It is NVMe PCI Express. Has a read speeds of 1700 megabytes per second and write speeds of 600. But it does boot up fast at about 14 seconds. Now there is a spare uh, SSD slot uh, should you wish to upgrade. Now, although it has killer Ethernet, the Wi-Fi card is an Intel 8260. Now, speeds are okay, but the signal strength was quite weak. The battery is 73 watt hours. Now, there is supposed to be a 94 watt hour one, and I have only actually seen that in, uh, in Europe. Now, the battery uh, doesn't charge when the temperature uh, is at 45 degrees or higher. This is to protect uh, the, the battery life. It uh, provides ample battery life though, and uh, be sure to upgrade to BIOS FB06. It went from four hours to six and a half hours when I did my 25% brightness battery saver YouTube uh, streaming test. And this is just shy of the razor blade, which got uh, six and three quarter hours. Now on the left hand side, there is a mini display port, an HDMI 2, USB 3, microphone and headphone uh, jacks, uh, USB 3.1 type C port. Now it's a big letdown. There's no Thunderbolt 3 port here. And we then have the speaker grill. Now on the right hand side, we have a speaker grill, SD card reader, two USB 3 ports, one of which actually charges devices when it's powered off. And you also have the power button. Looking around the back, we see the hinge forward design, which uh, is used to accommodate the uh, heat sinks. Port wise, we have the uh, power connector and the killer ethernet port. Now the build is all uh, aluminium and it feels solid and premium. The lid uh, does show some uh, fingerprints, but I do like the plain look that uh, it doesn't shout uh, gamer and it uh, does look uh, as if it'll be fit into a business environment. Uh, the lid has uh, a mirrored Aorus logo. It's the raven's head and the arm representing performance. The keyboard does have uh, some uh, flex when you're typing, but gameplay is fine. The AWSD keys are also highlighted. The backlighting is white and it has two levels of brightness. You can have them uh, set to be active all of, the all of the time or on auto, which uses the light sensor to turn them on or off. Now the right hand keys um, also double up as the number pad. And you have a series of macro keys here on the left hand side, which you can configure up to 25 macro shortcuts. You have indicate indicator lights at the bottom, but unfortunately, the symbols don't light up in the dark, so you have to remember what they are. They do, however, indicate the, the battery level uh, when in standby mode by pressing the bottom right-hand corner of the trackpad. The mouse buttons now are, are embedded into the trackpad and have a, a raised surface, so you can feel them, but they are stiff, small, and to be honest, not the best. Two-finger scrolling works well, but uh, pinch to zoom is very poor. Performance can be tweaked, using the uh, ELAN uh, settings. The screen is 13.9 inch and uses IGZO uh, technology to provide a more power efficient display. Its side bezels are very thin at about one centimeter. It's not G-Sync, so it does have optimal support. The panel is actually made by Sharp and it's the same one used in the 2016 Razer Blade. The resolution is uh, QHD+, which is 3200 by 1800. It does actually have good viewing angles indoors but not so good outdoors as the screen is quite reflective. The 250 lux brightness that I measured is the middle of the road really, but it does have decent color accuracy, 97% um, of sRGB, 72% of Adobe RGB, and 67% of NTSC. One thing for sure, you will certainly be spending a lot of time wiping off your fingerprints off this display. The system comes with lots of blowware, as uh, you are greeted with a half dozen uh, shortcuts when you uh, start a computer. Now, some, some software is actually quite useful. The Xplit Game Maircaster, 
the macro engine, uh, the AOS uh, audio equalizer, but the most useful is the command center. You have 15 uh, shortcuts available. The first is the overclock gauge, which shows you all the speeds, temperatures uh, that your PC hardware is at. It, I find that to be very useful and can be minimized um, to the bottom of the screen so you can see it at a quick glance. Next, you have the uh, overclock screen. Um, here you can overclock the GPU four levels. You can use Afterburner to get a better overclock and uh, that increases it to, uh, to 182 megahertz on the core and 95 megahertz on the memory. That's about 100 megahertz faster than the inbuilt software. You can overclock the CPU. The max is 4.3, which is actually only clocks uh, the core zero to 43 multiplier, core one to 42, with the remaining two cores at 40. In my tests, I test all multipliers at 4.1, which generally pull 58 watts at load, which is about 15 watts less than the uh, same CPU in the Alienware 17. The next good option is uh, fan control. Now you can have it on quiet mode, which I believe turns the fans off at idle. I measured 29 decibels, which was the same for the normal fan at idle. At load, the normal fan um, is at 44 decibels, spinning at 4,759 RPM. You then have the gaming fan, which at load spins at 5,146 RPM and produces 47 decibels of noise. Finally, you can customize the fan speed um, to reach maximum at uh, 5,557 RPM, and that's about 48 decibels. Other options include the backlight, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, camera, uh, the blue screen and the adjustment of the USB charge mode. The webcam is a bit of a disappointment though. At $2,000, I would have expected to have a 1080p camera. Here's the webcam, what it looks like and sounds like. I think it looks like a 720p webcam. The two two watt speakers are adequate. Um, nothing to rave about though. This is what uh, they actually sound like. So how does it perform? In my handbrake test, where I convert a four gigabyte video file to MP4, it takes four minute, uh, 40 minutes, 34 seconds at stock. That is 3% faster than the i7-700HQ in the Acer Predator 17X. I don't think that's too bad. Now overclock that to 4.3 gigahertz and that goes down to 38 minutes, nine seconds. Now, although that is a good showing, it is still 4% slower than the same CPU in the Alienware 17R4, but of course, that Alienware is much bigger and has a much bigger cooling system. So it can handle more watts uh, than the uh, diminutive Aurorus. Stock uh, CPU temperature was fine at 83 degrees Celsius. Running the, uh, running the overclock with uh, an undervolt of 4.5 millivolts and turbo fan, the CPU was at 79 degrees. Looking uh, at uh, PC Mark's creative test, the Aurorus beat the Razor Blade 14 with the i7-6700HQ by 7%. Overclocking saw the lead increase to 12%, and you can see the benefit of the higher clocked CPU here. As the PC Mark tests actually do represent a good uh, test of everyday uh, computer work. Now let's test the CPU using Cinebench R15 multi-threaded test. At stock, we are at 719 points with a temperature of 83 degrees. That's not bad, and although the, it does beat the i7-6700HQ, it is slightly behind the i7-700, HQ and the i7-7820HK in the 17-inch laptops I tested. Now overclocking saw a nice rise of uh, 851, which is similar to my overclocked i7-6820HK in my GT73 VR. Now that is not bad. Granted, the same processor in the Alienware 17R4 beats it by 5%, but still, that is an admirable performance. Undervolting and use of the turbo fan did help maintain a good CPU temperature at uh, 83 degrees. Okay, so CPU only tasks run uh, fairly fast and cool. But that is a big but. Throw in some GPU work and that temperature equation falls flat on its face. Let's take a look at its cooling first. Now underneath you have a vent um, over each fan, a central, van, a central vent over the uh, SSD area and a vent over the heat pipe. Now this vent is critical at keeping it cool, which I will show you in a bit. Removing 10 screws, that you take uh, the back off. Now you only have two heat pipes and they are shared between the CPU and the GPU. Everything is copper, so if you have air blowing through that vent, it will make a big difference. The pacing job looked like a, a stamp, to be honest. So I did do a repacing using Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut um, after all of my tests. Unfortunately, the temperature results uh, were the same. So I will be trying to use uh, the Thermal Grizzly uh, Conductor Naught 
and uh, see how if that makes any difference at all. The trackpad is uh, 29 degrees, AWSD keys 38 degrees, keyboard to the center was a toasty 43, right hand side was 35, the hinge where those heat pipes are, that's 47 degrees. Now that is pretty hot and to be honest it's too hot to touch so that area underneath um, is 48 degrees again it's far too warm for your lap in the middle underneath there it's 42 degrees and at the sides it's 35 I recommend that you use a laptop uh, cooling pad or desktop um, so you don't burn your legs here okay so you now I know how hot the chassis gets and you can see why so let's take a look at some of these GPU tests battlefield 1 at 1080p Excellent performance, even at stock 69 FPS, which beat the razor blade by 25%. Overclocking this GPU to level 4 saw a 4% improvement, but doing the max overclock saw a nice 13% gain at 78 FPS. Now, although I don't show it, here my GT62 VR with a GTX 1070 scored 84, but it comes at a price. Using stock settings and normal fan, the CPU was at 93 degrees and the GPU at 87. Even under volting and using the turbo fan didn't really help that much on the CPU. It's only when uh, the notebook cooler was introduced that we got below the 90 degree mark, all because the CPU shares the same heat pipes as the GPU. Okay, so what is it like at native resolution? 38 FPS, still playable. Now remember though, this is at uh, ultra settings. So dial down those settings a little bit and you might get uh, closer to the 60 mark. Now for Doom, 1080p ultra settings. It takes an overclocked razor blade to match the AOS uh, at stock. That is uh, pretty impressive. Overclock the CPU and GPU, you see 95 FPS, which is 10% faster than the overclocked uh, razor blade. Stock temperatures, um, you see CPU temperatures at 92 degrees. Anything 90 and higher actually does see thermal throttling, so you do need to get below that 90 mark. That was actually only achieved by throwing in the notebook cooler into the mix. Overclocking though, pushed it even uh, beyond the help of the notebook cooler. Now Grand Theft Auto 5 at 1080p. This game eats CPUs for breakfast. At stock we get 85 FPS, but still hot at 92 degrees. Overclock we get 92 with FPS, which is about the same as my GT... Uh, 70, uh, 62 VR with a GTX 1070 in it. Pretty amazing really, I must admit. Having a fast CPU for this game really does help. I finally got a decent CPU temperature by undervolting and using the turbo fan. At uh, native resolution, you can see the benefits of using the turbo fan. I did help, uh, the, uh, it did help the throttling uh, when it was overclocked. Now, Rainbow Six Siege. At 1080p, max settings, we see 56 FPS. That is 19% faster than the razor blade. I don't think that's too bad at all. This game is more forgiving uh, on the CPU, so even overclocked, we get uh, 87 degrees using our undervolting tweaks. At native resolution, you will uh, need to reduce uh, image quality settings, uh, but I'm sure you will get uh, still get a good frame rate at, uh, at high settings. Now, let's take a look at uh, Tomb Raider and Mafia, Mafia 3. At uh, 1080p, we see uh, similar, similar results with the razor blade. 40 FPS in Mafia 3 and 60 in the mid 60s in uh, Tomb Raider. Again, undervolting is needed to uh, help with those uh, CPU temperatures. Now, finally, Fire Strike. The Aurora's at stock beats the uh, razor blade by 8% and uh, overclocking does give it an extra 9%. But to get decent cooling, we need to undervolt using turbofan and a cooler. Cast your mind back to that vent on the back of the panel, the one over the heat pipes. The Momo City cooler I was using in these tests doesn't blow air into that vent. So I bought a Cooler Master U3 Plus. Now this comes with three fans which you can adjust and place them where you like. So using this Momo C uh, City uh, cooler at 4.1 gigahertz, we get 89 degrees here in Time Spy. Using the uh, U3 Plus, we get 86 degrees. A nice little saving there. So your choice is critical uh, on the cooler here. You must blow air into that vent. So to conclude, the Aorus X3 V7 is very fast for its size, even approaching a 15-inch GTX 1070 Skylake model. But it does come at a price. Not only is it $2,000, but it runs hot, and you need to do some tweaks to get the best out of it. At stock, it is still fast, but I do question its premium over the i7-7700 uh, HQ models, unless you do actually overclock it. Now, perhaps the Gigabyte uh, Aero 14 or 15 actually would be good choices. 
anyway i'd like to thank you for watching thumbs up uh, if you like and subscribe if uh, you would like to see some more bye now